Welcome to another edition of The Brand Called You. Today I have a very, very accomplished millennial who is not just a professional but an entrepreneur as well. Nikhil Garg, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Nikhil uh, is a consultant with BCG, the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Wonder Learning in the UK. He studied at McGill, London Business School, and of course, in early days, he was in Indonesia and Amsterdam. So, Nikhil, tell me a little bit about your early days and uh, you know how you led up to uh, your yeah. MBA. No, so I've been um, I've been privileged that my father had a job that took us to many countries. Um, we first started off in Indonesia, and Indonesia, as as you've also uh, been to before, um, you tend to get spoiled. Um, you have a lot of luxuries there. Um, my father was an expat, and you had a lot of ex the expat life mm. that that you would live. Mm. Um, but the real changer for me um, was when we moved to the Netherlands. Okay. There'd be situations where I'd come home from school, mom would be there, and she'd say, "Okay, Nikhil, it's time to go to the grocery store." Mm. Then I'd say, "I have to go to the grocery store. Mm. I have to go on my bike and get that." Mm. Um, and then it, the, the truly formidable change was when I went to boarding school. So parents again moved towards Nigeria and, and that's where I, I felt I really grew as a person. Um, I had to make independent choices. I had to become independent. Um, I had to also try to focus on my studies as well as not only on my friends and my social life. Um, and that really taught me how to prioritize. Um, and continuing on from there, I realized as well that I tend to get bored of a place very quickly. Um, I wanted to explore new countries and I wanted to go to North America. And that's primarily why I chose to go to McGill. They had a great program in economics and finance. Um, I, I studied that for four years. And then again, I, I felt this urge to come back to Southeast Asia. That's where I had my formidable years. That's where family was as well. Um, unfortunately, my, my father also passed away during this time. And for Sorry me, yeah. um, a priority was also coming back to family. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say that's probably a second defining moment for me, which okay really told me as well that there's a bigger picture to this, right? And it's not just the small things. Um, it's what do you want to prioritize again? And that for me was family as well as an emerging market. Correct. It's a huge growing market that I wanted to be part of. Mm -hmm. And that sort of led me towards, um, towards Singapore and Malaysia, where I did a lot of projects with BCG. Um, and then again, that's when after three years, I said, it's time for me to grow further. I did my MBA at, uh, at LBS. Um, did that for two years, reflected a lot in terms of what I wanted to do, um, realized that entrepreneurship is something that excites me. I wanted to try start my own business and that's where what? Wonder Learning had started. So I'm going to come back to Wonder Learning, but let's stay with, you know, when you can move back to Southeast Asia and you joined BCG. Yes. So my first question is that what made you choose consulting? So like... I would say any typical millennial, mm -hmm. I came out of undergraduate not knowing what I wanted to do. I, uh, I had done a lot of economics and finance. Part of me at first thought maybe I should join the World Bank. Maybe I should have some sort of economics rule. Um, and then I, I tried an internship in consulting and, and I loved it. Um, I thought it was a great way for me to get exposed to many different types of industries, many different types of clients and companies, um, really sort of hone in on what will make me tick, what makes, what drives me. Um, and that's the experience I got at BCG. Mm -hmm. um, and still I'm getting that, that, that experience. Wonderful. Um, so it, in, in short, it, it allowed me to explore different industries, different types of companies. Um, and it's also made me realize that I really like consumer goods and retail. Okay. And then you decided to go to do your MBA. So my question to you is, uh, what was the value add you got from an LB, MBA? Yeah. And how important or relevant is it to do an MBA? So I, I think it's, it's very important, especially in today's world where you're constantly bombarded and have, have the thought of the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, the MBA allowed me to take the time to reflect, allowed me to try different things, for example, entrepreneurship, for example, working in a startup. And just, I don't think I've ever gotten that time, especially in a fast pace like BCG, to just sit on my couch for a week and just reflect, think about, okay, what do I really want to do? What makes me happy? And I think in, in your day-to-day -day work, you just are constantly at BAU that you never get that time to reflect. So I think that's... What is BAU? Uh, business as usual. Okay. As in you're just constantly working as a status quo. You forget that I'm much older. Than <laughs> <you>. <laughs> and so it, 
I would say that's the first part. It allows me to reflect, it gives me the time to experiment. Um, and then it also just broadens your network. Okay. Uh, you start to meet people outside of the bubble that you live in, in terms of consulting, in terms of your family, and really start to meet people who are doctors, who have started their own businesses, uh, who have been in the army, who have been um, working in all sorts of industries, and you hear their stories in the classroom. And you just get a very different perspective mm -hmm. to what you would have never really thought is out there. Very interesting. So I'd say those are the main sort of uh, Very interesting. value adds. And then Nikhil, after your MBA, you chose to go back to BCG. And I'll come to yeah. your entrepreneurial stint in a, in a while. Uh, you went back, obviously BCG has been good for you. Yes. No, they have. They're, they're a fantastic firm to work with. Uh, a, a lot of me realize as well that I want to move back to Southeast Asia. I still, I don't think my consulting career is over as yet. I still want to experiment and try new things. Um, and uh, and that's why I wanted to go back. It's it's really rebuilding that network that's back there. It's um, it's again going back and, and really getting a industry specific knowledge in terms of consumer goods and retail. Um, I want to be consumer facing, and that's how I really as your show is build that brand. Uh, and that's why I think going back to BCG is um, is something that I want to do right now. Wonderful. So tell me, you know, you have uh, you mentioned that branding retail is something that you're really interested in. And you are a millennial, very good with technology. How is technology changing uh, the industries that you like? Yeah, so uh, I look at it first in terms of consulting and then also in terms of consumer goods and Correct. retail. Uh, first consulting wise, it's consulting companies are no longer just strategy based. Mm -hmm. uh, they're trying to get virtually integrated to offer implementation solutions as well. So that means you'll see a lot of companies buying startups and companies that can build digital products for you, um, that can implement IT solutions, uh, that can do all your sales and marketing, implement CRM tools, etc. So you'll start to see companies in the consulting side acquiring the knowledge and expertise to try and offer these to, to their clients. Um, in the consumer goods and retail space, uh, I see a huge trend, especially in FMCG, for direct-to-consumer. Okay. It's bypassing the whole retail segment on products that you don't really need to go to a grocery store for. So think about Dollar Shave Club as a great example. Um, they completely disrupted Gillette's model by going directly to the consumer. Um, and I see that happening as a sort of shift in terms of how companies need to adapt. I think there's a whole offline, omni, uh, offline online channel presence as well that um, they're no longer two separate worlds. Correct. Everything is combining into one. Correct. Where consumers are sometimes, they may browse and shop for the best price online, but they may go to the store to actually purchase. So how do you actually deliver that connected experience, both online and offline, um, in a very seamless way? That maybe a, a store manager knows that, hey, you actually looked at this online. I know your profile. Maybe I can just show you the products that matter to you. Uh, because customers, I believe, really want that connected seamless experience that says, okay, this company knows everything about me and can offer me that tailored solution. Very interesting. So then let me, you know, use that as a segue to the next question, staying with retail, consumer facing branding, and that's e-commerce. Yes. How is e-commerce changing the traditional formats of retail? So um, I, had a, I had a client who was a grocery retailer in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and they were struggling through that. Mm -hmm. There were new entrants in the market, especially for a lot of your um, your non uh, non food items. All of those have now shifted towards e commerce. Mm -hmm. So the question to them was, how do you bring a customer back to the store, and why does a customer go back to the store? Mm -hmm. And the main elements are today. Even me, I still like to buy my food and my vegetables and fruits, everything in the grocery store because I like the look and feel. So does that mean as a grocery store you need to start? allocating a lot more space towards something that's experiential for the consumer. How do you bring them in? Maybe if you're a family member, do you incorporate sort of play zones in, in the store to really bring them back into the store? Okay. Uh, when it comes to um, even, even uh, apparel retail, uh, how, do you, how do you incorporate technology? So for example, you have smart mirrors that are starting to come up in, in stores where you don't have to go to a changing room. Mm -hmm. You can actually see right away in the mirror uh, and flick through, okay, this shirt looks good for me, this doesn't. If you can then incorporate what's in your wardrobe and start to recommend, um, these are the sort of clothes that uh, that will work for you. You're creating this new experience. And I like to think millennials are all about experiences these days rather than possessions. 
right? It's how do you create that experience in store to really bring them back and then offer that sort of online, offline uh, experience for them. And yet, you know, I was reading somewhere that Amazon, which is this 800 pound gorilla, has started to build some uh, brick and mortar stores. And it makes sense because... Because they want touch and feel. Exactly. So you build the credibility in store. Yeah. Um, you build the... Uh, I believe it's more for their food and vegetable, especially with them acquiring Whole Foods as well. Mm. Um, they're building that credibility such that once a customer, customer trusts them offline, they can start to order a lot more other things online as well. And again, it's that balance between offline and, and on offline that I see happening. Very interesting. So Nikhil, let's move to your entrepreneurial uh, stint which is wonder learning yes tell me a little bit about this venture yeah it uh, a lot of it arose um, a both in consulting as well as during the mba where i realized many people that are entering the workforce as well as people who are looking to transition to new jobs uh, don't have the requisite digital skills education today really focuses on subject-based learning mm -hmm. but ra rarely focuses on productivity tools so when you think about doing simple analytical tools like Excel, Tableau, mm. PowerPoint, to even how do you run a digital marketing campaign? How do you use Google ads, Facebook ads? How do you build a website? These things aren't really taught today. Correct. And, and we looked at what, how are different solutions out there? There's a lot of online learning solutions, but we realized that's very ineffective for somebody that wants to start from scratch. It's good to learn niche things. So say, I want to do this particular thing on Excel and it's great to learn. Mm. But it's very ineffective if you're starting to scratch because you don't know if you're learning the right thing. You don't have a coach to actually consult. And then on the other hand, you have a lot of offline learning tools, but they're costing 500,000, 2,000 pounds, um, where it's more focused towards b 2 b to c So companies will sell their employees, do this course, get credited, come back, and then say that you have this accreditation. Okay. So how do you really focus on that B2C market, okay. make it affordable? And that's what our whole uh, problem statement is about. And the way we're solving this is um, you don't need an expert in the industry who's been teaching for 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. You can actually take a master's PhD student, or an early young working adult mm -hmm. to teach it. Okay. Uh, as long as you provide them with the right content, it's very interactive, very personalized, keep the group sizes small yeah. and offer these classes either both in a live setting or in terms of an online live setting. Mm -hmm. But everything is live. That's the key critical thing. Okay. Which means that people come online and you teach. Online. Exactly. Um, and so you have a forum to ask your questions in a closed setting that people are comfortable in. People get the confidence that they're learning the right materials because we try to relate everything to a real world problem. Mm. So for example, with Tableau, which is a data analytical tool, mm. a data visualization tool, we try to relate it to assume that you're in, in sales, you've been given data for the last three years, for an office supplies company, and you need to answer these top five questions. Mm -hmm. On Excel, it would have taken you two, three days to do this. We'll teach you in an hour and a half how to visualize the data and generate insights through a hypothesis-based thinking. Mm -hmm. And so we're really just trying to change the way in terms of how learning is done. It's not just feature A, feature B, feature C, feature D. No, it's we learn for an objective. We learn for an outcome. Uh, and then once you understand that outcome, then I think learning any tool is quite easy. But be very specific in what you want to learn and what's the applicability towards it. Wow. Wow, that's quite amazing. So a question for you, as I ask a lot of startup entrepreneurs like you, uh, should you have a partner or a co-founder or should you go solo? I 100% believe in you know, a partner. Your partner. Um, I've been blessed to have an amazing co-founder who's actually also my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's important to choose the right partner as well. Um, we're very open with each other, very honest, mm -hmm. but you have a sounding board okay. to constantly um, test your ideas, test your thinking. Otherwise, you tend to get uh, worked up in your own mind in terms of, oh, is this the right thing to do? Having a co-founder gives you the assurance, gives you the um, uh, gives you the ability to also really deep dive into the nitty gritty and, and test your hypotheses, test your thinking out in, with a sounding board. Okay. Um, and it's been, it's, been, it's been really important. Mm -hmm. It's just finding the right partner where you can be open and honest. Mm -hmm. I've seen people in the MBA who've chosen partners, but they can't be honest with each other and tell them, hey, I don't think this actually can work because of ABC. Mm -hmm. They'll try to cushion the mm -hmm. way of thinking. And I think this is where you have to be straightforward. You have to Correct. be open Correct. and just be brutally honest. Yeah. Uh, if you can't, then I think you need to rethink who, who, who your co-founder is. The relationship. Yeah. 
So again, based on your experience, you know, uh, I'm sure you've had a lot of uh, knowledge from people who you've seen starting up different companies based on your own learning as a startup. What, in your opinion, are some of the basic mistakes a lot of startup entrepreneurs make? I'm definitely victim to this. I wonder learning is definitely been victim to this. Okay. Uh, I would say one of the biggest, a uh, couple of couple of mistakes. I would say one is going too wide. Um, one example is around wonder learning. We first started off instead of just focusing on digital career skills, we were said, why does it? Why is it so costly to learn any skill? Mm -hmm. If you want to learn the piano, if you want to learn the flute, if you want to learn cooking, if you want to have a gym trainer, in the UK it costs almost fifty to seventy pounds for any of this. So we said, okay. Peer-to-peer -peer learning can happen, not just in digital careers, yeah. but for everything. Yeah. And so when we started, we offered everything on, mm. on course. But then we realized we can't market anything. Mm. Who is our actual customer? We can't say our customer is everybody. Mm. Because when we start to do our marketing, start to reach out to consumers, we also didn't have any sort of tagline or anything to associate us with. Again, it goes back to what is your brand and Correct. why do people come back to you? Correct. And so we realized we struggled with that. So we got really good advice at one point that said, don't even just focus on career skills, just focus on maybe analytical tools mm -hmm. and see are people willing to buy a product. Uh, so that's, that's one learning is not going too wide. First start small, do that really well and expand really well with that and then start to offer other courses or other, uh, other types of subjects. Okay. I would say the second one is, um, it, it is more on outsourcing versus keeping it in-house mm -hmm. and what is critical to your business. Um, we first got somebody to help build our website um, and that relationship ended up turning quite sour okay. because as, as much as our developer said he could do all the things we wanted him to do and we were quite clear with mm -hmm. the user stories that we had asked him uh, in terms of developing the website. But uh, he took on too much. He kept delaying, delaying, delaying when um, the delivery day was meant to be September. It was still end November. Um, and we realized that uh, both, both my co-founder and I, we said, uh, sometimes take the hard call and we let the developer go. Mm -hmm. But then within 48 hours, we used tools like Squarespace and WordPress, developed our website, actually developed a website that was much better in terms of functionality because we integrated with Zoom, mm -hmm. integrated with Skype, uh, uh, Zoom, sorry, Zoom, Stripe, um, as well as a scheduling tool mm -hmm. where we actually automated a lot more than what we thought we could even do. Wow. Um, and so I think there's that balance between what you outsource versus keep in-house mm -hmm. and given scheduling, given payments are all critical to the business. I would say that's the second learning as to determining what do you, what can you outsource? So things maybe like admin, legal, mm -hmm. uh, those can be outsourced, but critical to the business, you keep in-house and you do yourself. And my last question to you for wonder learning before I move to the next segment. How have you funded your startup? So being a student, it's obviously you're cash strapped. Okay. Um, but I think that also helped us to really bootstrap the business. Um, we're of the opinion that test very early, test your product, even though if it's 20, 30% ready, mm. get your customers to pay for that product. Yeah. Um, and so in our testing phase, uh, we, we, ended up gener we ended up getting about 100, 150 customers, all paying customers. And we use that to help develop mm -hmm. our, um, our, uh, our developers yeah. and our ongoing costs and our marketing yeah. as well. Yeah. And so that I'm a big believer as well is we didn't ask for any outside funding. We didn't use any of our personal money. We use our customers money to reinvest into the business mm -hmm. and, um, and then keep learning from that and keep tweaking it. Just get that out early. Um, and yes, I think now we're probably at a point where we may look for funding to really ramp up our marketing. Mm -hmm. But bootstrapping helped us to A, really focus and tweak our business model to see what works and what doesn't. And once we're ready to say, okay, now we want to really increase from 1,000 customers to 10,000 customers, that's when you we think funding is, is super important. Wonderful. Wonderful. So Nikhil, moving on, you know, you love adventure sports. Yes. And, uh, you know, you've done all kinds of things from scuba diving to... Uh, uh, Backpacking. Backpacking and when you jump out of an aircraft, what do you Sky call it? Diving. Skydiving yeah. and so on. Tell me first, what has attracted you to such intense adventure sports? So I'd say I'm an adrenaline junkie. Mm -hmm. um, as you can tell with me moving around every three years in different countries, I don't like sitting still. I like being active and I get a huge kick out of it. It allows me to, I think a good example is scuba diving. Um, scuba diving is almost meditative in a sense because you completely disconnect 
from the rest of the world. There's no gadgets, there's nothing. It's just you, the water, you hear your breathing. And the it's a whole new world out there. And, and that just keeps me going. I always think about, even when I'm working, what's my next holiday? What's my next plan? Uh, because I, I, I look forward to these things. And and if you I feel like if you're not looking forward to something, what's driving you and what keeps you going? And that's that's a big driver for me. And you know, you got yourself certified as in scuba diving. Yes. Where did you get yourself certified? I got it in Central America, actually. Okay. So I I, um, I told BCG that I wanted to take six to nine months off mm. after graduating mm. to just backpack, travel by myself. Um, it I went for three months in Central America. So I started in Guatemala and went towards Panama. Mm. And throughout that backpacking experience, somebody actually introduced me to the idea of scuba diving and said Honduras has one of the best places, not the Guchigalpa, which is probably the, mm-hmm. the highest murder capital in the world, but okay. in the islands towards the north of Honduras. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just spent a week and a half there. I was meant to go there for two days. I loved it. Mm-hmm. I decided to, after trying it once, get my scuba diving license, both beginners and advanced. And, um, and I never look back. And uh, at least once every two, three years, I like to go on a one week scuba diving mm-hmm. trek. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last one was in the Komodo Islands. So if you haven't been, I highly, highly recommend. I haven't. I have not been to Komodo. It's, it's beautiful. Wonderful. And which one of these is your favorite uh, sports? Uh, right now, I would say scuba diving. Scuba diving. Uh, it, it really just allows me to, again, reflect, just to get you kind of come up after your scuba diving in a very relaxed, meditative mm-hmm. state. Mm-hmm. As if you have done meditation for about 30, 45 minutes, because you just hear your breathing, uh, you see very different things mm-hmm. than what you would see on the opposite side of the yeah. world. And of course, you live in Singapore, so therefore there are many opportunities to dive in, in all of exactly, the stations. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So let me move on and ask you a few questions personally. Um, in your life, have you had any people who had a strong influence on you? And if yes, what have you learned from them? I'd say my strongest influence would be my dad. Um, and I don't think I realized this until after he passed away and in, in my early years as working. Mm. He would do, he would say simple things, just growing up, um, you know, read the news, be well versed with it so that you can have a conversation comb your hair, you need to look presentable, small things like this, um, even in terms of the workplace, what what it means to be having a presence, what it means to talk with clarity, um, all these small lessons, which at the time I would say, dad, stop giving me lectures, give me, a break. give me a break, stop constantly trying to tell me what to do, how to do it. But then I reflect back and I keep thinking he was right. Mm. He was always right. He was always right with the way he kept telling me about what to do, how to think about it. Mm-hmm. But I think the key was, is was that he wasn't ever prescriptive. He never said, do this, you have to do it. He made me really reflect and think about what it means to, um, uh, to focus and to, uh, to focus on not only just your family, but your business, to have clarity in terms of your thought. Um, and and I, I, I keep thinking about what would dad have done in a certain situation. And that also helps me answer um, a lot of problems and dilemmas I have in life. Yeah. And, and he was also much into sports. I think you climbed Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro, he did Kilimanjaro as well. Um, he was an avid runner. And he used to gym. He actually got me into gymming. In, um, uh, when we were young, 12, 11 or 12, he actually put a pull up bar mm. in our back garden. And he would wake us up at 5 30 in the morning and he'd teach us it's so important to be fit uh, because uh, your health is everything, right? It's, it's super important. Yeah. Um, uh, to incorporate fitness not just as a as a routine but as a lifestyle. Mm, very interesting. So my next question is that what would be three words that define Nikhil? An interesting question. Uh, I actually I try to ask other people as well um, before before this just to see what their perspective as well as this. For me, I would say I'm I, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I am a guy who looks half class full Correct. Um, and, and in any, any situation. Uh, on simple things, when problems go wrong, I try to bring the best out of people um, and, and just be optimistic in scenarios. Mm-hmm. Look, there are a lot of things that are in your control, there are a lot of things that are not in your control. And I try to look at it from that point of view as to if it's controllable, what can you change? If it's not controllable, what can you do differently from this perspective? Uh, the second thing I would say is um, I'm I, I'm a big people's person. I, I get along with people very easily. Um, I have friends all over the world and I connect with them very easily. And I would say that 
that perspective and that open mindedness, I would say, helps a lot. I think it helps even in consulting. It helps with starting my own yeah. business because you're constantly meeting new people and just being able to be warm, comfortable, open, but also just listen to them okay. and listen and hear their perspective. Okay. I think that's that I've been taught throughout moving different countries, just how to do this and really build up that strength. Okay. Um, and then I would say that the, um, the third one is I, I like, I'm data driven. Mm. I, I like data. I like, it, it may sort of, um, be too be a bit too much, but I need data to really drive my answers and give an opinion on something. So I need to read a lot. I need to hear different opinions uh, to then form an opinion and say, no, this is this is what I believe in. Okay. Uh, but when I believe in something, then I will I will really go for it. So Nikhil, I have time for two more questions. Uh, tell me, what is the most outrageous thing that you have done, and do you look back at it with the uh, Pleasure or regret? Uh, I would say the most outrageous goes back a bit to backpacking. Mm -hmm. I was 21 at the time, just graduated from undergrad. Uh, and I've always had in the back of my mind that I want to experience what it's like to just travel by yourself, expose yourself to a country mm -hmm. where you don't know the language. And Central America is a country where I knew very little Spanish, uh, but I wanted to live in a house for one and a half months mm -hmm. in a Guatemalan home. And see what it's like to just take yourself outside of a comfort mm. zone. So I, I lived with a, with a mother there, uh, very basic living. Uh, I mean, I've been very uh, lucky and privileged to have had all the comforts. And I just want to know what that feels like to give me perspective. Okay. Um, and it, it truly was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, I think it taught me as well that it's, it's so easy to be happy. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's easy to, to get caught up in all the big things around you. Mm -hmm. But I saw just people are so happy with the basic things around them. I saw this mother, I saw her child out there. And they're such happy, genuine people. And, and that just brought, back, brought me back to reality. Um, and I definitely don't have any regrets. I was very scared, obviously, going there in terms of what am I doing? Why am I doing this? But I look back and it, I always think about that specific moment. And that just grounds me back to reality to say, hey, appreciate what you have, appreciate what's around you. And also just don't forget that it's also important to give back. And I think that that always just is my reality check uh, that I like to put on myself. So definitely no regrets. Wonderful. So my last question to you, that if you had to tattoo on your arm a message to yourself, what would it be? So my my dad always used to joke with us about uh, there being four F's. It's fun, always have fun in your life, always be fit, always prioritize your family because family comes first and they are your rock, mm -hmm. and always maintain your friendships. And I would do something along those lines uh, and, and get it out of it. But that's how I want to live my life and, and believe that as long as you're having fun, you're fit, and your friends and family are around you, then you can solve any problems, you can do whatever you want, and you'll always be happy. Those are very, very wise words, even though from your dad, but coming from you at your age, that's fantastic. Nikhil, thank you very much. No, it's such a you. pleasure speaking. Thank Thank you for listening to the Brand Called You podcast. Be sure to visit tbcy.in to join the conversation, access show notes, and discover fantastic bonus content. You can follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Simply search for The Brand Called You. Thank you, and see you next week.